How you doing, everybody? Ah, uh, let's see. Hi, Abdul and John and Thomas and Raj. Um, let me ask you, uh, how's the um, the picture and the sound and everything? Uh, we got a new um, we got a new system, and uh, I just want to be sure it's working okay. So it's okay. All right. Good. Hi, Bruce. How you doing? Okay. Great. Hi, Nephron. Good day. <laughs> oh boy. Okay. Um. Hi, Dominic. Dominic, I got a question for you. What are you doing up so early? <laughs> Dominic, I've, I've been thinking about taking one of these and getting a very, very fine laser cutter and see if I could cut this big um, uh, plate into sort of smaller finger uh, bridges. So anyway, you're the guy that knows about those things. Okie doke. Uh, well, let's um, let's let's talk about some stuff. Um, the last video that I uh, that I put out uh, recently was on trying to find sort of. Um, Sort of things that you find in your very top notch watches, but in something much more affordable. Uh, for example, the uh, Swan Neck regulator that you find in watches like Lang and Hein. And then you can find the woodpecker <laughs> in the uh, Mule uh, Glasuda. And so, you know, it, it's sort of like to me, that's all, that was a, a very affordable way to get something from a higher level. Um, and so what I wanted to talk about today, oh, okay, Dominic, thanks. Uh, if you have any recommendations on, on a good jeweler's saw, let me know. <laughs> I'm gonna end up with, with a train wreck, but I, I, I think it might be fun to try. I wanna talk more about that in this afternoon. Hi, Indrajit, how you doing? Okay, um, so let's um, let's uh, let's take a look at at some things. This is one of the watches that I've had for years. It's a Harry Winston uh, Premier by Retrograde. That's the full name of it. And the interesting part about it is, is the by Retrograde is by uh, Agenor by uh, Jean Marc Viderec. And now this wasn't a bargain watch. Uh, it was relative to to what the original cost was and everything else. I got a really great deal on it, but that that's neither there. What I want to do with you guys, if we can, is to talk about say, look, what are some other things that we might look for? And I bring up retrograde because um, the other day somebody. See, I was working with um, uh, this was this is a while ago, really about a month or so ago, uh, with the rancher, and what what we found was that there was um, a really cool and relatively affordable Van Cleef and Arpels, and I think it may have been a chronograph, uh, and it had some features in it that we found out later that were done by uh, Agenor, and so there's stuff out there. And I'm wondering what other things we might be able to find. And I wanted to enlist your your wisdom today about that. And and what are some things that <coughs> excuse me that we might take a look at? Hi, Gilberto. Hey, Rancher. Belgiu 72 and a watch I just acquired has vertical clutch and a manual out. That's exactly uh, uh, Clyde. That's exactly what I was thinking about. Had something like that. Hi, John. John Dunnell. Um, hi, M Marty. 
Good seeing you. So, oh yeah, okay. Happy Easter, everybody. Everyone who uh, celebrates Easter, I know that uh, the rancher likes to go on Easter egg hunts, but <laughs> the rest of us can have some fun too. Okay, um, so let's um, so let's have some ideas from you guys. Some of the cool things that are that are in a watch for. I I don't want to go too much into over complications. I mean, one complication per watch is usually all I can handle. Uh, I, I don't even like chronographs because they have too much stuff in there. But uh, I do like what uh, Clyde mentioned with the um, uh, the vertical clutch in a, in, a, uh, in, a, in a watch. There's another one too, and I and it's a it's a value that's in the mono retro pont that I have. Uh, the mono retro ponts, Beauvais mono retro ponts had, I think it's a Valju 82 or 84 in it. And, you know, it's, a, you know, to find any kind of retro pont, uh, let alone a mono retro pont, I thought was, you know, pretty cool. Hi, Koji. How you doing? Which of you sub 10K watches tickles your fancy the most movement wise? Sub 10K, sub 10K. Well, it, it, if there are two types of sub, uh, <laughs> I got, there, there are two kinds. One, you got a really good buy on it. And the other is, um, it's, you know, you got it pre-owned. The best deal I ever got on a sub 10K watch was on the, um, uh, this is H Moser. It was called a uh, double uh, Henry Double Hairspring. I got it from this guy in Switzerland, who since has been running on sort of had been running in a lot of trouble uh, with some kind of family squabbles with his business and so forth. I don't know if he ever straightened it out. Uh, the last time I was in direct contact with him, it wasn't straightened out at all. So I sort of backed away but that thing was I'm pretty sure yeah i got a buy on that thing uh white gold <laughs> double hairspring that thing is that is the very best one i ever found i don't know if there are any around that are under 10k now but what happened you used to be able to pick up a lot of parmigianis and h mosers i mean for really great prices but they're just not around anymore. And uh, I mean, at lower prices, I think, you know, once people wised up to them, what they were getting, you know, with the uh, washer movement in the, uh, let's see, not only in the Parmigiani, but I think if you poke, or poke around, you can find some more. So, um, Koji, that's to answer your question. <laughs> it's, that's about it. That's what was the best deal I've ever found. But what what we're trying to look for not only is under ten thousand, uh, but a whole lot under ten thousand, even under one thousand. And I I think that's important. Hi, Tanzil. See, Clyde. Uh, tonight we will be an Easter egg hunt on the Archie Luxury live stream channel. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. Let's see. Hey, William, how you doing? Okay. So let's. Um, uh, you guys, uh, <laughs> see what we can, uh, what we can find here. All right. So I, I wanted to start off with this one, with a, um, the. Uh, it's got one thing in it that's super high horology by a really good uh, watchmaker. Uh, what are some other ones that you have uh, that you might think about or what you can find them? Uh, you mentioned a brand, uh, Hint Shell. Um, boy, I, are, are they a German watch, uh, Indrajit? I think I... I think at one time, in fact, uh, Rancher and I went through a lot of stuff. Uh, 6498 uh, dash one equipped watches. 
exactly. Still my favorite, very favorite. Uh, you can go, in fact, you can find those on Joma Shop, a lot of Tussauds. One of the things that, that make Tussauds sort of an interesting target is that they're owned by Swatch. And because they're owned by Swatch, they can put in all of the uh, 6498s and the other ones that have come to be owned by ETA. But I think the Unitas uh, 6497 and 98 are two really of the, of the really finest uh, uh, movements around. I, I, I have, um, I think they even have them, I think what ETA does is they have them at different levels. Okay, hi Patrick. Uh, I think we can add. Let's. I think we can find a lot of development at Gloss Hoodie Original Group, also Nomos. Which ones in either one of those? Yeah, but they're they're starting to go up the level. I'm <laughs> I'm sort of closer to the bottom here. Under the reason I mention this is that when we look at a watch and we evaluate the the value of it in terms of the the goodness of the horology of um, what is it i mean is it how good is it really is it something that is like you know the 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 whole process of watch buying and by the way too i think i've been sort of rolling in a different direction with high horology uh, as defined by sort of the basically the the watch conglomerates, what it is you're talking about gold and, and really great finishing, and uh, there is some acknowledgement to fine workmanship, and of course that's extremely important. But there's certain elements in there, like they have you know they talk about that, but like a handful of them have a Remontaud Galate. Or you know, and some of the other things that make a really expensive watch worth having. Uh, that Derek uh, Pratt watch with the incredible dual uh, detent and, and uh, the thing that looks like a rotary uh, engine movement. I forgot the name of the one, but it's that watch is incredible. And it's, uh, unfortunately, it's so far out of uh, most people's financial range that it might as well be on the moon. And so this is why I keep looking, okay, so we got to sort of push down and down and up. Hey, Tony, how you doing? Johnny? <laughs> hi, hi, Young. Tour B watches uses the 6498 and beautifully finished. You're right. That's a great example. Um, you know, a long time ago, I think I forgot how long ago it was, um, Clyde and I had a sort of a joint thing that we were looking at all of these different German watches. And I, I really haven't looked at them that much since then. Essentially, what these are watches are ones with inexpensive, uh, relatively inexpensive watches and that are, very, are finished very nicely. All right, and so you have ones with the 6498, 6497, and then they have engraving and a lot of other things they put on there. Now, engraving and uh, finishing and anglage and all of those things, I think, you know, really bring a watch out as being something special. But beneath all of that, there is is the horology. Really, none of the, the, the engraving, the finishing, the anglage, generally don't have anything to do with horology. And, and I think, uh, and especially sort of traditional horology, this is the one where they're not using uh, metalloids and some other kinds of things that are better. I mean, they work better, but, you know, <laughs> we're back to quartz watches. Hi, Maurizio. How you doing? And Flip and Zippo, how you guys? Um, Anyone know about the Seiko 68 caliber movements? They're quite thin and attractive. Okay. Um, hi, hi, Mahita. Mahiha. I, I'm sorry. Long Jeans has a mono pusher column wheel chronograph in the heritage line. They can be found for around two and a half K. Thanks. That's a. Yeah. 
Uh, okay. Um, so let's see, what else is there? This is something, the, the reason I keep harping on this is that there are a whole lot more collectors with a lower budget than a higher budget, <laughs> all right? We have, I have every now and then I'll find a really good buy on a watch and still it's, you know, it's fairly expensive. The Urban Jurgensen that I've loved for years and never thought I'd be able to get, suddenly I find one at half price. And, you know, is that like in a, in a secondary market? By the way, too, let's talk about something. I just want to switch it a little. Uh, we're good with time. And, and that is, you know, I, I see all of these videos and so on and so forth, and they talk about the gray market. The gray market, to me, is an AD's um, definition, all right, or characterization. It's really a secondary market. And when they have to get rid of some stock, uh, because they have an overabundance of watches of some type, it's suddenly not the gray market anymore. It's, it's, it's you know, Joe who's got these, who buy all of your XX watches and sell them at uh, places like Joma Shop and um, uh, Shopworn and uh, even some other, some other uh, similar places. But <laughs> when they need them, they're no longer gray market. Suddenly they're the secondary market. And, and I think the secondary market is a better term because gray market, is somewhere between the, I guess, the black market and the white market or the AD's market. Not only does that sound, you know, a tad um, <laughs> type of ethnic stereotyping, but it's wrong. Uh, and I think that the term gray market is so, sort of something that has to do with ageism. So I'm not going to call it gray market anymore. I'm going to call it the secondary market. And the secondary market, I think, is really sort of the best fishing hole, I'll put it that way, or the best hunting ground, because you find so many different watches. There, there's some places I get, it, I get these emails and they say, oh, we're having some kind of big sale. And I look at the watches and they're all the same. There's a certain group of watches that keeps coming up again and again and again, and none of them are too interesting for for me, either because one they're too expensive or two they're they're not very interesting, and so I, I that I think. But on the other hand, if you go to some of these places where you know you better put your wallet in your front pocket, you know, like Forty Seventh Street, you can that's where you're going to find all your best deals. But in order to do it. You really got to be smart about it. Um, a guy, a well-respected guy uh, that I know, and you all know too, I don't want to mention his name uh, because he's a cool guy, really. Uh, he told me, he said, Bill, stay away from 47th Street. Uh, this is uh, the Diamond District in New York City where they have these watch stores where if you don't know what you're doing, you know, you'll go in there. And be wearing a barrel by the time you're finished negotiating. These guys are very good at it. On the other hand, uh, the 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 best watch deals I've ever had in my life, both of them, I got it. Uh, this guy that I had to sort of was like going into a speakeasy, you know, tell him Joe sent me, and the guy was perfectly legal. It was, um, it just was in a place where you had to know what you were doing, and this is how come I always, you know go on and on about, oh, well, you know, you guys need to do your research. It's simply an economical thing to do it. Not, not, it's not a matter of, you know, I know more than you. It's really a matter of, I can get a better deal this way. All right. And keep it. The thing is, is that a lot of time people will see a deal and not realize that's what it is. Oh, uh, simply because they, you know, haven't. Uh, young June Pack, 47th Street is intimidating. You are right. And so if you go in there, you better you better know what you're doing. It's really funny. You know, it's just there's um, 
I don't know, once I'd bought a, a get out of jail free card at Tiffany's <laughs> before. It. So so I went down 47th Street with this Tiffany's bag. And you know, here you have the, this is the diamond district. And the looks you get is more like, oh, that guy went to the cheap store. It's unbelievable. I mean, not cheap in terms of price, but cheap in terms of quality. But it, the more you, um, you know, yeah, you, they do have crazy inventory. That's what I'm talking about. You find certain things and, you know, you go in there and you say, oh, hi, you know, my name is <laughs> Sam and I want to buy a watch. And boy, they'll sell it to you. But if, unless you know the value of the watch and you're ready to negotiate, probably not the best place for you. I, I, you know, it's sort of like, you know, some guy in those, they're always a stereotype of, the uh, you know, guy with a uh, some hayseed kind of thing that fell off the turnip truck and goes in there and gets sort of figuratively mugged. Um, <laughs> you know, it's not, I'll tell you something though, speaking of mugging, I've never felt unsafe in terms of that on 47th Street. I got a feeling if somebody tried to mug you there, they would be in trouble, way worse trouble than you could ever be. Uh, that place is not a place to, to pull a jack on anyone. So anyway, so that's a, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to go off on that, but the, but the point is, is that the, the secondary market is not a, not trying to, you know, to call it the gray market, uh, is is I, it just inaccurate because it's not somewhere between the AD market and the black market, you know, where you buy stuff where that gets smuggled and things like that. Uh, recently, an ex colleague of mine got a, a Speedmaster from a gray market, and not gray market. Come on, Enderjet, we're going to call it secondary market. It, it, unless it really is, it was either the black market, the AD, or the secondary. Uh, he was lucky he got two watches in one, Rolex crown with <laughs> he got a He got a marriage watch. Yeah, you know, the thing of it is, is that, you know, somebody goes into an AD and they, you know, they buy the watch they want. And they say, oh, well, this, this particular model has a premium on it. And you're telling me that you're getting ripped off in a gray, a so-called gray market? I don't think so. <laughs> I think anybody who pulls a premium is is um, you know worse than any kind of thing you're going to find in most secondary markets. But say, oh, these guys are AD, so they must be good. That's not true. I, I tell you, one of the the watch businesses see more corruption there uh, than. <laughs> So many others. Okay, I don't want to go on about that, but let, let's just refer to it as a secondary market, and we'll let the hay shakers call it the gray market because they don't know any better. All right, is that uh, where that uncut gym movie took place? It could have been flipping Zippo. It could have been. I mean, they got diamonds down there. They got, but they got the looks of people. The way they look at you is like. You know, you're a hot dog about to be gobbled up. <laughs> and sometimes you are. Uh, let's see. The rarest of watches, Rome Galax. Uh, secondary market point in watches. That is the market. Yeah, there you go. I mean, it, it's like it, it's like calling the um, uh, AD, well, I'll call it the AD market. It's like calling them the suckers market, okay? Because to some extent, if you could, if you can get a watch for a fraction of what you'd pay, you know, walking into an AD. Now people say, well, you got a guarantee and you got this and you got that, and that's true. You got a warranty and some other things, and if the watch falls apart, you know, that's rough. Or if you get one that's a, that's a mix of an Omega with a Rolex crown. I saw this. There was this great watch I really wanted. Um, and, and this is what I, I mean about knowing certain details. And it was on Chrono 24. It was one of the original Vassarone Constantin um, Prestige de Paris. Okay. 
back in 1972 or 74, uh, Vassarone Constantin won a prize. It's called the um, Prestige de France. It was the first Watts company that ever won that award. And they had a big deal about it in, in uh, Paris. And so they came out with a watch. It was called Prestige de Paris. A very cool watch. Very formal watch. So um, I, I got, in fact, I still have it. I still have the, uh, the, the 1972, I think, version of it. And the second version. And I thought, well, wouldn't it be cool if I could collect all three? There were three models made until they cut them out a couple of years ago. And so I see this watch, and I thought, man, it was really at a great price and so forth. So I, I contacted the guys about it. And between the time I contacted them and, and had a closer look, I realized that the um, uh, crown was not the, the right crown. And then I started finding some other stuff. And so it's a matter of, again, it's going back to knowing what you're doing. Hey, Stefan, I uh, just got into watch, <laughs> but I'm finding I like quartz watches better than mechanical. Is that unusual for collectors? I also love my new Tynex Modern Reader. Uh, well, Stephen, if you like uh, the uh, uh, quartz watches, that's fine. I, the, the thing that we tend to talk about, okay, our, our watches was sort of what I'll call traditional watchmaking. And traditional watchmaking goes back, if you want to put a date on it, is sort of the pre-quartz. Uh, since then, they've been doing a whole bunch of stuff that we've argued about. <laughs> I'll put it that way. Um, uh, let's see, what's going on? Hi, Scott at 825. How's it going? Good morning to you. Um, <laughs> thanks, Stephen. Roar the Tiger. How you doing, Roar? Uncut Diamonds was shot at 47th Street. There you go. You guys, you know, if you're ever in New York, in fact, this is what I hope they have this year, is is that um, you, you go into, uh, what's it called, the Watch Time Show. In October, they have a Watch Time Show, and a bunch of us, you know, sort of regularly go, and it's fun to see people. I know that... Uh, uh, blue shirt Buddha's there, <laughs> Bruce. And uh, there's this, I was going through my old pictures, and there's this great picture of me and Bruce and um, Adam, Adam Brunch. And we're, we're just, you know, hanging out there, having a good time. And shortly, either before or after that picture was taken, we had the greatest conversation with Stephen uh, Forsey. And, and so if you go to something like that, you know, walking down to 47th Street and, you know, just sort of, you know, taking a look at the different watch shops and so forth it is a lot of fun, okay? But like I said, you know, put your put your wallet in your front pocket <laughs> as you go down there. Um, okay, Tony, let's see. What are you guys talking about now? It's just a different genre of collecting. Thomas, that is a perfect way of putting it. It's it just a different way of collecting. You know, I I suppose the uh, there's a point where you can do something with a watch and understand how it's working. That's important to me. Uh, the way a battery runs a typical quartz watch I, I, you know, it just doesn't do anything. On the other hand, the, all of the issues uh, that they have with a mainspring unwinding. By the way, too, I'm working on a uh, working on a new video. Let me see if I have it right here. This is <laughs> this is my latest project uh, that I'm working. On. I hope to have a video done by uh, Monday for you guys on on this uh, new one, but it's with a, with a mechanical watch using traditional things, you can find so many interesting things. You really can. And it's true that there are some quartz watches like uh, FP Jorn's Elegante that <laughs> are really interesting. It's frying pan time. Okay, Bruce, thank you very much. Um, well, listen, uh, this afternoon, uh, I'm going to be 
uh, talking about another topic, and this has to do with modifications. And these modifications aren't, they're, they're transformative only, I think, and as far as I'm concerned, and sort of what we can see in a watch, not, you know, putting a funny hat on it or anything like that. Okay, guys, uh, thank you all. And, and if you celebrate Easter, happy Easter. <laughs> Take care. <laughs>